university because I come from a family of engineers. In fact, my father and the women engineers of the United States encouraged me to become one. And obviously, I did not heed their advice. Uh, but since I am surrounded by a including as many references to Gandhi's words, his teachings, and his principles, because after Tuesday, I realized that those of you in this room probably know more about Gandhi than I do, with all my studies and my teaching of nonviolence. And so you are going to see how his <coughs> teachings and principles permeate all of facilitative conflict resolution and nonviolence today. My students are aspiring to emulate an inspiration like Gandhi. You know, if he had not lived, they would not believe that it was possible for someone to act the way he did and have such power. Ah, uh, thank you so much. I could hear that it wasn't working, but now it is. Okay. Have such power, what beautiful timing, to catalyze social justice. He inspired the entire world. And my students, the youngest of my students, still know of Gandhi, thank God, because they wish to aspire to do the same. And I'll say more as I talk today. Oh, this I added this morning as I woke up in the desert of Rajasthan, and I could feel its space and its silence. Now, this is for the faculty here who is an environmentalist and represents our green concerns of Gandhi. Um, in the United States, I don't know if you know this, but we have a long tradition, and it is not just the indigenous tradition, it's also the contemplative tradition of various groups to go to the desert to seek wisdom. So I thought how appropriate it is that we are discussing ethics of conflict resolution and Gandhi here today. Yes, I don't know why he's doing this, but uh, I encourage you to move up closer if you're having a hard time hearing me. We can be a community. Good, thank you. Okay. Now, you heard my history. Uh, and actually, Berkeley was, I was at the University of California, Berkeley. They were a pioneer in bringing conflict skills education into peace studies. That, and that was about 15 years ago. It actually is somewhat controversial among peace studies academics. Mm -hmm. Yes, it comes and goes. I'm going to start to pick it up and walk around the room. And I do not want to distract from Gandhi and nonviolence by teaching negotiation and conflict skills. But some of the faculty there with the loudest voice and the most power uh, were Jewish Quakers of all groups. And they said, no, we will not distract from Gandhi and nonviolence by teaching negotiation and conflict resolution. Because truly they are one. They work together. And they were visionary. And I think your vice chancellor has the same vision uh, and I believe Gandhi would have evolved with the times brilliantly. Uh, he showed no sign that he wouldn't. You know, you can, you need to. It's on. So, you know, it's. I'm not holding. This is not your responsibility here. Um, he, you cannot judge someone by their words alone. You must study their example. As he said, my life is my message. And based on his life example, I have deep faith he would have evolved in grace. And so I was asked, actually, I can use my courtroom voice here. Should I stand up and talk? or? OK. Well, I'm going to ask my audience from the back. OK. I'm trying to not be conscious of this mic more than you. Um, actually, those in the back, I'll tell you as a professor and a former litigator in the courts, um, I am most concerned about you. So will you promise me that you will take care of yourselves and move up if you can't hear me? 
and I will try to let go of this concern. Um, because I really do want to focus on the importance of the message today. When I was asked to teach practical skills in peace studies, I was not just to asked to teach in traditional academic ways. I was not just asked to give a lecture like I am today and to test my students on their comprehension or give them respected texts and ask them to be tested or give me their analysis. I was being asked to teach them how to master some of the most fundamental skills that Gandhi demonstrated, dialogue with those that we may not be accustomed to dialoguing with, problem solving, uniting, coming together. So they were asked to do what we call practice and applied ethics. It was not enough for them to argue right and wrong. And I will show you how I've engaged them in practical problem solving to prepare them to be practical post-graduation. Very important. And every theory that they study in conflict resolution, we call this action theory. It must not only be demonstrated in a laboratory or with an empirical study, it must prove itself again and again in practice. This is exactly what I see Gandhi exemplifying with his experiments in truth. Over and over he learned from his successes and failures. That's exactly what my students do. We have a living laboratory. And if you have been to the United States, you may wonder, how did I come, go from Berkeley to Los Angeles? I realized in Norway many years ago that many of the residents of Los Angeles were dying in violent ethnic conflict. I was sitting with the Balkans, I was sitting with Israelis and Palestinians, and there was a man from Los Angeles who talked about the lives being lost there. And so I am teaching students now who have grown up in some of the poorest, most violent neighborhoods of the United States, how to build peace. And it is not enough to read a book and be inspired by a distant example. They must learn to actually do what Gandhi did for the survival and future of their communities is very important to them. And the other thing we talk about, and I'll repeat, is reflective practice. They must reflect not only on how their actions are impacting others, but on how others are viewing them ethically and morally. Are they inspiring, as Gandhi did, with their principled action? Or are they fooling themselves, you know, using all of this in order to look better or advance their interests? This is a constant moral reflection. As I've just described, I am teaching them to be active practitioners of conflict resolution. Now I would like to talk about technical education for a minute because I have had the pleasure of just finishing a three-year study of students' disposition towards social justice with faculty from other campuses throughout California. Now, some of my colleagues were social work faculty, education, didn't have anyone in English, I wish I had. Um, but amazingly, one of my colleagues is a professor of computer engineering at Cal State, San Lu Luis Obispo. And he and his colleagues, because the code of ethics for technical professions includes a commitment and a consideration for justice, believe that ethically technical people must also be taught what I'm teaching my